All right, kiddos, welcome back. We're starting a new chapter today. We're going to talk about solutions today. And I know on the heading of your notes it says, you know, I'm going to have you look on the Internet to define these terms, and it's going to be done on your own time. But I just can't help myself. I'm an enabler. So I'm going to go ahead and define these terms for you. Um, you can look them up on your own to verify that I'm telling the truth and such. Um, I'll also demonstrate a couple of these terms for you. Um, um, at the end of this video. So let's begin as we talk about solutions. Let's talk about suspensions, colloids, and the Tyndall effect. Just by the way, suspensions and colloids are not considered solutions. I just thought it might be a good time to talk about these again. We actually mentioned them at the beginning of the year. So a suspension, you might recall, is a heterogeneous mixture. Do you remember that word, heterogeneous? It means it's not uniform throughout. And it's a heterogeneous mixture where the particles in this mixture um, settle out over time. So if you could imagine um, sand and water, the particles of sand will eventually settle to the bottom of my beaker of water. That's a suspension. Um, Another suspension might be oil in water. We might have uh, the oil separating due to d differences in density uh, from the water. Many uh, suspensions can be separated by filtration. So can be separated by filtration. We'll talk a bit more about filtration in just a few minutes. So a suspension is a heterogeneous mixture where the particles settle out over time and they can be separated by filtration. A colloid is another type of heterogeneous mixture. So it's still heterogeneous. Um, and the particles are of intermediate size. So it's a heterogeneous mixture and the particles are of an intermediate size. So you might be saying intermediate. Intermediate between what and what? Well, um, of intermediate size. Let me put the word size in here. All right. That would be between the atomic size, like atoms, molecules, and ions, and suspension size. They're so small that the particles remain suspended in the mixture. They don't settle out upon standing, and they can't be filtered. Uh, milk would be a great example. Milk has butterfat globules suspended in mainly water. Those particles are too small to either rise to the surface or fall to the bottom. They end up staying suspended in that mixture. They cannot be filtered out. Now that brings us to the Tyndall effect. And I've drawn a picture, or not drawn, I've thrown in an image of the Tyndall effect. That, uh, we're shooting a beam of light from this direction through both beakers. And you can see in the first beaker where we have a solution, or maybe it's pure water, we can't see the light reflecting off of anything in there. However, in the second, we can see the beam of light. And the reason we can see the beam of light is because it's reflecting off of tiny colloidal particles. So the Tyndall effect is simply the scattering of light by colloidal particles. So this is a great example of that. Another good example might be your headlights um, while you're driving through fog. Those would be considered colloidal particles. Or if you get the chance at home, take a flashlight and go ahead and shine it through some jello. And you can see that beam of light reflecting off of suspended colloidal particles. So this is called the Tyndall effect right there. All right? Now solutions. That's really what we're going to spend a lot of our time talking about in this unit. First of all, a solution is a homogeneous mixture. Solution is just a, a synonym for the term homogeneous mixture. And if you remember, homogeneous mixtures are uniform throughout. Now they don't always have to be um, let's see, solids dissolved in liquids. We could have gases dissolved in gases. 
We could have um, a gas dissolved in a liquid as well. So I'm going to give you a few examples of solutions in just a minute. Solutions are made up of two components, the solute and the solvent. Essentially, the solute is the thing that gets dissolved in the solution. So it gets dissolved in the solution. So if I had salt in water, my salt would be the thing that gets dissolved by the water. So my salt would be my solute. The solvent is the substance that dissolves the solute. So this dissolves the solute. So in my salt and water example, water would be my solvent because it dissolves the salt, my solute. Another example might be toenail polish remover. Um, acetone, toenail polish remover, would be my solvent because it dissolves the solute, toenail polish. You guys okay with those two terms? So solutions are made up of solutes and solvents. Now, a couple of examples of solutions that I was telling you about. They don't always have to be something dissolved in water. Air is a great example of a solution. We have nitrogen gas, which makes up about 80% of the air you breathe, and oxygen gas, which makes up the other 20%, essentially, of the air you breathe. Another definition of solvent that I've heard is it's the component of a solution that's present in the greater amount. So since nitrogen makes up 80% of the air you breathe, and oxygen only makes up about 20%, we would call nitrogen the solvent. Carbonated water is another great example of a solution. Of course, my solvent is my water, and my solute is, my car is carbon dioxide, which of course is a gas dissolved in water. Ocean water, we have water and all sorts of stuff dissolved in it, but we can also have oxygen gas dissolved in water. That's what the fishies are able to respire with. Um, there's some other examples. If you look down at the bottom, you can see a couple of solids. We have steel, which is a solution of iron and carbon, which are both solids. Um, I think we talked about brass in class before. In fact, I believe we made some brass in a demonstration where we have zinc and copper um, um, dissolved in each other, and they make the solution brass. Okay? A couple more vocabulary words. Um, we can actually separate the components of a suspension two different ways. There's probably more than two different ways, but two ways that I'm going to make you responsible for. The first we just mentioned earlier in this uh, discussion, and that was filtration. And filtration is simply using a porous barrier. Let's see. Hopefully I'm spelling porous right. Huh. Well, you guys can check my spelling later. So it's using a porous barrier to separate um, the solid from a liquid in a heterogeneous mixture. Oh, you've all seen coffee filters before, haven't you? Separates the big coffee granules um, from, the, from the solution that's made as coffee is prepared. You all know what filtration is, I think. Now, magnetic attraction, that's also sort of something that I'll bet you sort of have an um, uh, intuitive understanding of. Um, a magnetic attraction is just simply the differences in magnetic ability to separate. the components of a heterogeneous mixture. So if I had sand mixed with iron filings, for example, it was all mixed together, I could hold a magnet over that mixture, and the iron filings would be attracted to the magnet, but the sand wouldn't. And so I could use differences in magnetic ability to separate the components of a heterogeneous mixture. Okay? All right, a couple more vocabulary terms, and then a little demo that I'm going to add to this video for you. Uh, the first is distillation, and this is 
a couple of, uh, this is one of the ways we can separate the components of a solution. We can't filter a solution. I can't take uh, Kool-Aid, for instance, and pour it through filter paper and separate the sugar and Kool-Aid flavoring from water. It just won't work. The particles are at the molecular level and they fit through that porous barrier, the filter paper, very, very easily. So we can use distillation as one method to separate the components of a solution. And distillation is simply a method used to separate the components of a solution by differences in the components boiling points. So a method used to separate the components of a solution by differences in the components of the solution's boiling points. And you'll see that in the demonstration here in just a little bit. And finally, the last vocabulary term for the day is something called chromatography. We actually did this at the beginning of the year. I'll show it to you in, uh, in, in the same video I'm going to show in just a minute. But let me just remind you that chromatography is simply a technique that we use um, to separate the components of a mixture based on the ability of each component to travel across the surface of a fixed substance. So it's a technique used to separate the components of a solution based on the ability of each component to travel across the surface. Oh, I'm running out of room. I'm just going to say the travel across the surface of a fixed substance. And you'll see I will separate the components of a water-soluble marker um, by the process of chromatography in the video that comes up in just a second. So I'll show that now after the video we're done, uh, after the demonstration we're done with this video. So we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. All right, kiddos, welcome. We're gonna do a short video demonstration today. I'm gonna to show you how to separate the components of a solution a couple of different ways. One is by something called chromatography, and the other, let me show you my distillation apparatus, is by distillation. So when we do chromatography, I have a couple of water-soluble marking pens here. One is black and one is green. And I've just used some filter paper. I've cut it into rectangles. Um, I placed a black dot on the bottom of that filter paper, and I'm going to place that in my beaker with water in it. And you can notice when I do that, the water begins to wick up the filter paper. And soon it's going to come in contact with the, with the pigments that make up that black marking pen. And I'm gonna do the same with my green dot, my green marking pen, and you can see the, the water slowly wicking up. Of course, when that water comes in contact with those water-soluble pigments, they're going to be wicked up along with the water um, up the filter paper. And when they do, the different pigments related to their size and how well they're attracted to the filter paper will move at different rates with the, with the solvent. And so we should be able to see a separation of the individual pigments that make up um, that black and green marking pen. So we're going to let that uh, go for a little while. We'll come back to it in just a second while I talk about distillation. So inside my boiling flask here, I have some copper sulfate solution. You can see it's not pure water. Um, it's a homogeneous mixture. And I'm boiling it. And as I boil it, the water in that solution ends up boiling and the copper sulfate doesn't boil. Um, it stays behind. So the steam rises and it goes through this condensing tube. Now this condensing tube you'll see is connected to a cold water spigot here and I have cold water coming into the bottom of the condensing tube and moving upwards 
and now it's draining out of this other tube into my sink so I don't make a big mess. Now when I do that, that will cool the steam, not all of it you'll see, <laughs> as it moves through my condensing tube and recondense the water and we can see it dripping into a beaker. And you can see the water that I've collected is now crystal clear. It's no longer a solution, it's now, um, it's now just water, um, the compound H2O. And I've effectively separated the water from my copper sulfate due to differences in boiling points. So if they have different boiling points, I can separate them by something called distillation. And that's what you're seeing here. All right, let's go back to my chromatography demonstration. And you can see inside my beakers that, yeah, we are getting some separation. Um, it looks like the black marking pen is made up of several different pigments, and the green, maybe not so many. Well, let me show you an after shot that's dried so we don't have to wait here for 15 or 20 minutes. Here is what the black will look like over time. You can see it looks like the black pigment has blue and red and, and yellow and a couple of other colors in there. And the green shouldn't be too surprising to you. Looks like the green has some blue and yellow pigments in there that moved at different rates. And that's what I'll see as this continues and the water continues to move up that filter paper. So this is called chromatography and this separation due to differences and boiling points is called distillation. Alrighty, thanks, bye-bye.